So I am gonna go ahead and get us started then. Um, if anybody comes in late or whatever, we'll catch them up. Anybody who jumps in on the participants for the Zoom call, we'll, we'll catch them up too at the end. Um, my name is Kay. I am the research specialist here at the East Baton Rouge Parish Library in the genealogy department, or one of them rather. Um, and this class obviously is intro to, or is researching female ancestors. Yay, okay, good, thank you, ma'am. Um, so one of the unique problems that we run into when you first start doing your genealogy, within the 21st century, you're not gonna run into this problem quite so much because women started to have their own records separate and apart from fathers and husbands come the 21st century. So things like birth certificates, death certificates, marriage records, that kind of thing, all are much more common within the last hundred years or so than they were prior to that. So as you start working your way back, it's gonna get harder and harder. Um, so our, oops, help speak with the right thing. There we go. These are our objectives within this class. Um, we're gonna to try to learn about some of the problems that we encounter researching specifically female ancestry review some records created by and about women. So there are some records that are more commonly associated with women than they are with men. Those are some of the things that you're gonna to wanna to try to look for. And you sometimes kind of have to think outside the box to access those things. We're gonna learn some new research strategies and discover resources to understand social and cultural history and laws. So within various cultures, as well as within various areas, um, things tended to be a little bit different. We're gonna talk about a couple of examples of how women's lives were handled differently in Anglo-centric societies versus, for instance, um, Italian and Spanish genealogies. So some of the common problems you're gonna run into, these are the four most common ones. Obviously, lack of records is probably gonna be pretty high on that list. Just finding out who she was and where she came from can often be quite a challenge. Um, surname changes, diminished legal statuses, and then, as I said, some cultural differences. These problems will often go hand in hand. When a woman marries, she takes on her husband's surname in general. And again, most of this stuff is going to be centric to the United States. We do have some classes, like I said, the one that's for uh, Sicilian ancestry next week. We do have a few various classes that cover um, cultures outside the United States, but for the most part, we're looking at America here just because we're on a time constraint and we just don't have time to go into everything. Um, therefore, you're going to find fewer records for women because most of the business matters then would be conducted under the husband's name. In other cultures, however, as we said, married women may have continued to use their maiden name in legal documents. French, Italian, and Spanish women, for example, used their maiden name on legal documents in their home countries and often on passenger lists. These cultural differences can be a source of confusion for genealogists. So sometimes you will have a mother traveling with her son on a passenger list, and the mother is going to have a different surname than her son because she's traveling under her maiden name. Again, most commonly that's going to be associated with French, Italian, and Spanish genealogy. So these are some common research strategies specifically focused around women from some really from some famous genealogists throughout the years. They've helped develop different strategies for re researching female ancestors. Using, um, we usually suggest obviously that you use the, the strategy most appropriate for the case that you're searching. So Elizabeth Schoen Mills on the left there, her project is basically, or her advice is basically to reconstruct the lives of men associated with the target. So you're gonna start with husbands are probably gonna be the most likely one because that's the woman, the, the, the man that she would have probably spent the most time with. Um, fathers, sons, and brothers. Um, Patricia Hatcher recommends identifying all reasonable possibilities then eliminating all but once, or all but one. So we're gonna look at an example of that in the future here. Sandra, I believe it's Lubbocking is how you pronounce her last name, suggests identifying the problem and using the earliest known fact to locate the woman in a time and place and begin your search there. We're going to talk a little bit about that strategy in a minute as well. Understand that you may not ever find a source that explicitly names the parents of a female ancestor. Again, the further back you go, the more likely that is. And that varies from state to state country to country, sometimes even county to county or town to town, the further back you go. 
Um, places like Massachusetts kept phenomenal records all the way back to the settlements. Um, places like New York just didn't. If you were born outside the city, you were pretty much out of luck. There's just not very much there. So sometimes you have to just work around a complete lack and absence of a record. You'll have to connect enough evidence to make a case for the theory that you're going on. So these are some of the sources that are generally considered to be created by women. Um, Bibles, family Bibles were often kept by women and handed down from mother to daughter, generation to generation. So that would then be filled in by the next generation, her husband and then their, their children. And it would be then passed down to her daughter who would fill it in with her husband and their children. Letters are a huge, we're gonna look at a couple of examples actually of letters are a huge resource for women because not only are they going to name names, but it gives you a glimpse into an everyday life. Same thing with diaries. Again, both of those kind of depend on the woman, all three of those really kind of depend on the woman being literate. Um, and in some cases that was common. And in some cases it was not. I have one great, great grandmother that was not and one that was. So it kind of depends on your upbringing, where you were, social standing, lots of different things. Um, and then copies. So copies of various records, particularly if the husband owned or was deeply involved in business, a lot of times women would then keep copies of those records because it was kind of their job to run the household. So even though they would not have had any real dealing in that business, they often were keepers of those records. Um, most often the brick wall in your family tree will be a female ancestors who made, whose maiden name or even her first name may be unknown. A lot of times, the, again, the further back you go, you'll start seeing her listed as Mrs. William whatever. And so you may not know either the first or the last name when you get started. That's kind of what this class is for is to help you piece those things together. When researching female ancestors, your main goal is finding out the maiden name, which may be as easy as searching a marriage record. However, marriages can often go unrecorded or the records can be lost. Again, um, for instance, I know there are several counties in New York because that's where some of my family is from, where they didn't start keeping marriage records regularly until the 1880s. So, I mean, that's, that's really late if you're trying to do research further back than a handful of generations. Finding her parents can often be an even more difficult problem. So some marriage records will list the parents, some will not. So if it doesn't, then you have to use the process of elimination to try to figure out where she came from so you can see if you can find the family that would have matched her. Begin researching with home sources, family Bibles, diaries, letters. These sources were typically created by literate women and handed down over generations. A lot of times you can find a lot of that information by contacting other people within your family um, cousins that you meet on your genealogical research. I've gotten pictures of my ancestors from cousins I'd never met. I've gotten, um, I have a uh, will and testament and the, all the probate records that go with that that was handed down to me for a great grandparent. So stuff like that can really kind of help put those pieces together for you. You'll also find them in library and archival collections. DAR has copies of family Bible records in their GRC reports and the DAR magazine. We have copies of both of those reports in our department too, because we house the Annie Moody library, uh, DAR library here. So it's not our library, but they house it here in our department. So um, and the, DA, the local chapter of the DAR, their library is housed here. Change. There we go. So this is one example of a letter, obviously. This is actually from the antebellum, let me see, records of the antebellum Southern plantations. Um, the authoress is S.A. Robeson in a letter dated March 26, 1831 to Mrs. Charles Hunt. So just in here, we can actually learn a lot if you sit and, and dissect the handwriting, you can read the whole letter. But right there I've, hand, I've, I've highlighted rather the names of several people who come up within this letter. You can learn a lot about a person and their relationships just from the way they discuss each other in these letters. So this is a letter that would have been written to somebody that she was familiar with about people 
who were a part of, of her everyday life, of Mrs. Robeson's everyday life. So you see here at the very top, the first one that's mentioned here is Margaret. She's mentioned simply by first name, no last name, no identifying information. This is probably a person with whom they are both very well acquainted. And Mrs. Uh, Hunt, that's what I wanted to make sure I was getting it right. Mrs. Hunt would have known who Margaret was without further identification. Whereas down here, you see Anne Hampton here. Most likely, that's somebody that they would have known, but she would have had to specify which Anne she was talking about. So we can gather from just that simplicity of the way that these people are addressed in the letter, how their relationships may have gone together. Mr. Stark doesn't have a first name with him, neither does Mr. O'Neill. So we can generally guess that those are not super close relationships. Um, Miss Bones, same thing. So the more intimate the relationship, the more likely you are to be identified in a simpler manner. Those kinds of things are things that can really help you put your family trees together because these are the people that you're gonna to wanna to research further as you do your history or as you do your genealogy. See if you can figure out who Margaret specifically was because this is probably somebody who is very close to both of these women. The next thing we're gonna move on and talk about is marriages and divorces. So in a female ancestor's life, this is probably the biggest, most defining move that she'll make is, is marrying and changing her name. So if home sources don't reveal your maiden name, we're gonna look at marriage indexes first. Uh, remember to search both civil and church marriages. So just because it isn't at the courthouse doesn't mean it didn't take place. It may only be in the church records. Again, the further back you go before things were required to be kept at the state level or the national level, like a marriage license is today, a lot of times a traveling preacher would marry a bunch of people when he came through town. So, uh, you know, 20 people would come and get married all in one day because that was the day that the preacher happened to be in town. Um, and therefore, the only marriage record that you may have would be the record from his collection at his church. Catholic church records in Louisiana, many of us are familiar with um, Father Hebert's book collections. So if your ancestors are Catholic here in Louisiana specifically, um, going all the way back to the 18th century, he, he transcribed all of those records and put them in bound volumes for you to find easily. They're organized by last name, by date. So they're very, very easy to use. Um, not always are they gonna be spelled correctly depending on the priest. If he was French, they would often be spelled the French way. If he was Spanish, they'd be spelled in a Spanish way. So you might have to you know, play around a little bit with your parameters, but most of those records are gonna be there. Marriage bans were the one female record that was always given to a woman during, mostly this goes through about the, um, Oh, the Regency era, give or take, all the way up to about the Civil War era. Um, marriage bans, that was your proof that the man you had married had married you. So in order for you to have any legal claim to anything that man owned, that little slip of paper was the one thing that proved that you were who you said that you were. Marriage bans were very, very important to women at those times. So they may very well often be something that would have been pressed in a Bible and handed down or collected in a group you know, in, for a historical society, that kind of thing. So you can't always just type the name into Ancestry and find that record. But if you look outside the box a little bit, there are a lot of resources for being able to find specifically marriage records. Um, look for multiple marriages for the bride and groom as well. For example, if you notice children who predate the marriage listed in a census record, the husband or the wife may have had a previous marriage. A bride may have married a second husband under the name of her first husband. We're gonna look at a couple of examples of this actually. Therefore, it's important to identify the first marriage to trace back to the maiden name. Divorces will usually be found at a county or parish level, like marriages. In some cases, divorces were handled by legislatures, so the records will be found outside the regular county court system in legislative petitions. Two good online sources include Ancestry, which has few divorce indexes, and newspapers, which frequently contain divorce notices. Specifically, if it was a woman petitioning for divorce, for abandonment or cruelty, something like that, 
it had to be publicly announced before it could be granted. So you will, you will often find them in the newspaper. It's just whether or not that newspaper has actually survived long enough to be indexed and put online to be accessed. Did they have annulments back then? They did, not as commonly. So she's asking if they had annulments back then, just in case my Zoom folks at home can't hear very well. They did, but they weren't as common then as they kind of are today. Um, a lot of times annulments were kind of something that really only rich people did because <laughs> it involved transfers of assets. Mm -hmm. um, regular people didn't generally get annulments because they cost money. What would they have done for uh, to get an, an annulment. Yeah. I'm not 100% sure of the process because I will be honest with you in the two years I've been here, I don't think I have ever seen anybody actually obtain one mm. um, in my research. I'm sure plenty of people did, but like I've never personally come across one, but I'm sure that if you gave me a little bit of time, I could look up the full process for you. It would have definitely most likely involved probably the Catholic church, mm. at least here. So that would be something that might be in Catholic records. We would have to look that up. That's a good question. Okay, so records are not perfect, especially before um, anything was kept computer indexed or typed. Uh, it's very easy to make a mistake on a record. So here's a good example of how you need to be on your toes with your research and double check all your facts. In days where all records were being kept by hand, mistakes were common, as I said. So this is a marriage record for Daniel Ramson and a Sarah A. Boardman, Sarah Ann Boardman. Um, it asks where they were living, it asks the age of each person, occupation, place of birth, so on and so forth. Over there on the right, the second column from the right here is the one that I want everybody to look at. And you see the little hash marks here, those are carried over from the previous page stating that this is the first marriage for both parties. Um, E.A. Buck is the clergyman who married them. However, this is not Sarah Ann Boardman's first marriage. Um, her first husband died two years before this marriage took place. So this is an, a, a, an error on the part of the clerk who was recording this marriage record. Um, whether she told them this was the case or not, the fact remains that had we found this record before we found her first, re her first marriage, we may never have known that this was the same Sarah Ann Boardman that married Daniel Ramsden. Um, her, her maiden name was Hurst and we have her marriage record to Daniel or to Alfred Boardman in England. So had we not known that we had the same person here and done the, the extra research to connect those two, you may have overlooked this record completely and never realized that this was your Sarah Ann Hurst. And you would have missed an entirely second, an entire second marriage and the two children that she had in that second marriage. So a lot of times doing your or following your women involves double checking and going back to make sure that you actually follow through on all of the information on the record. This is the proof of that, that previous statement. This is her death certificate in 1923, and it's filled out as Sarah Ann Boardman, um, widow of Alfred Boardman. These are her parents, so we know we have the right Sarah Ann. And you can see up here from the handwriting that her second last name was added later. It's different handwriting and it's written in a different kind of pen. So obviously the woman who helped fill this out as the informant, Mrs. William, her first name was Dora, but you can see here, she's just listed as Mrs. William Boardman. This is Sarah Ann's daughter-in-law from her first marriage. So she filled this out incorrectly. I'm not sure if Sarah Ann actually went back and started going by her first married name. She was only married for a year to Daniel Ramston before he died as well. So I don't know if she went back and started using her first name or her, her original name, um, her original married name or what, or why Dora thought this was the correct information to fill out for this. But the point is a lot of times you have to do extra research when you're dealing with women to make sure that you've covered all your bases. This is what we were talking about earlier, the example of children that are out of order on your census record. So here we have Robert Smith and his wife, actually it's listed here as Aurora, Aurora or Aurelia. Um, her name is actually Cerilia. I don't know what they were doing here, but it's, it's Cerilia. 
And then these are the children in that marriage. And you can see 13, 11, 9, 8, 6, 4, 2. And then suddenly we bounce back to seven. Sometimes that's just an, an error, but sometimes it can indicate that this child here is from outside the marriage that they're currently, that they're current, that the rest of these children are listed under. So Alexander is actually Alexander McManus, McMurray, I'm sorry, McMurray? Mm -hmm. Oh no, I'm sorry, Rilia McMurray, that's her maiden name. Uh, her married name was Rouse. So he's actually Alexander Rouse, I apologize. This is a lot of names to keep up with y'all. Um, but he was listed as the census taker came through instead of identifying mm -hmm. that difference. He just listed him under the Smiths and just did the tally marks there too. So. Again, if you don't double check all of this stuff, you might miss that, sh that Alexander is not actually Robert's son. He would have been John Rouse's son from Rilia's first marriage. So here's her marriage record to John and then her marriage record to Smith. And you can see here, Rouse or Runce, can't quite tell what the, the handwriting says there, but you, you get the point. Um, you gotta double check and then if you had not gone back and checked that, you might've thought that Rouse would have been really his maiden name, but it wasn't. Her maiden name was actually McManus. Newspapers and vital records. Information on a woman's family can be found in unlikely places like newspapers, social security applications, and obviously vital records. Um, in the newspaper, you'll find children's birth notices. A lot of times though, it will only be listed as, you know, Mr. and Mrs. William Smith, welcome a son, whatever but it's still a good place to, <coughs> excuse me, to get some of the information to build off of. Um, obituaries, marriage announcements, divorce notices, and family court minutes. The social security death index lists a, place, a person's date of birth and death, as well as their social security number. Once you have found an, an, an individual in the SSDI, you can request a copy of their original application. People born before the passage of the Social Security Act had to apply for it. These applications would list current address, date of birth, and names of parents. People born as early as the 1860s applied for Social Security after 1835. So that may be a great breakthrough for you if you had an ancestor who was born, you know, Civil War era, who was still around that long. Vital records are also useful for uncovering a mother's maiden name. Keep in mind that most states around the country passed laws requiring vital record registration within the 20th century. Um, Louisiana passed law for birth and death records to be kept in 1918, um, but it went about as well as you can imagine parish-wide. So you can't expect 100% accuracy until probably the late 20s. Um, that's about the time that we finally got everybody on board with actually recording every birth and death within the parish. Hey, so uh, Louisiana started 1918. Um, there were a lot of uh, Pennsylvania, for instance, I just know off the top of my head started 1906. So yeah, yeah, I was gonna say you might want to pick one of the ones in the back because that computer doesn't work. <laughs> uh, not all, city or, not all cities or states had these records before then. So prior to 1918, about the only place in Louisiana that you'll find those records regularly is Orleans Parish within the city limits of Orleans, of New Orleans. Um, some states restrict access to them. Louisiana has very strict privacy laws, uh, 50 years for death records. If there's a coroner's inquest on the death record, uh, it may be even longer than that. Not all of them get released at 50 years. Um, and it's 100 years for birth records. So if you had an ancestor, of course we started keeping them in 1918. So public access for birth records in Louisiana is only about three years. <laughs> it's 1918 to 1921. Why did they have a, why did they put a time frame on it? Uh, privacy reasons. So they don't want people to just be able to just go to the state archives and pick up a copy of your child's birth certificate. So it's a hundred years, they figure by a hundred years, most people will have, have passed on by a hundred years. Uh, 50 years for death certificates is again, privacy reasons. 
people are nosy. <laughs> and if you read a story in the newspaper that you think is really interesting and you want to go get a copy of the death certificate to find out what really happened to the person, I can't imagine as a family member that I would be thrilled with that. Yeah, with that process. So that's why it's 50 years. And that's why even after 50 years, some of them don't all get released because, yeah. What's yeah. About divorce and marriage? Um, marriage records are a matter of public, uh, public information here in Louisiana. Again, every state is a little bit different. I don't know about getting an actual divorce record. I do believe that they're locked for a specific amount of time, but I can't remember how long it is, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. um, but marriages are public record. Um, and every, like I said, every state is different. I know for a fact that like the state of Maine does not release marriage records for like any reason. And the state of Kansas does not release death records for anybody. You have to be immediate family members. I cannot get my great great grandmother's death certificate in Kansas because I'm not immediate family. Hmm. Like everybody who would have been immediate family is of course long since gone, but I guess I'm just out of luck on that. <laughs> they won't let you go and look at it? Nope, oh. they will not let me have it because I'm not considered immediate family. Yeah, good times. So yeah, every state is different. Um, so check everything. So this is, as we were talking about earlier, um, a an obituary, well, obituary for a Matilda Boardman um, who died in 1902 in Pittsburgh. The important thing about this is not necessarily who she was, but the fact that we have two different announcements in the Pittsburgh papers. You're not going to see that super often. Usually it'll be the same one repeated over and over and over. But that's why we tell everybody double check everything because they, had, they contain different information. So this first one is going to tell you uh, where she lived, what her husband did. It calls her 36. This one calls her 35. She was 35 because I have her birth record. Um, and it gives, the first one gives the name of her sister and where she lived. The second one tells us what church she attended. So having two different records of this gives us several different avenues to check out. Now we know the name. Y'all. Good afternoon. This is a reminder that masks or face coverings wear your must masks. be worn during your entire visit with us today. Your mask must cover <laughs> both your nose and your mouth. If you have difficulty wearing a mask or face covering, please visit the reference desk to learn about available accommodations. Thank you. Y'all wear, wear your mask. Okay. Um, so again, if you, if you did not check for one or the other of these, you may have missed the name of a sister or you may have missed the name of the church that she attended. And the church that she attended can give you further information. Unfortunately, this church, because I checked it out, does not have records that would have told me what happened to Matilda. But it gives you somewhere to check. Um, Mrs. James so Schofield, it's actually S-C-H-O field, um, is her older sister. And so that will give you one more avenue to kind of look through and try to find more information about the family if you did not already know where Matilda came from. Uh, yes, church records. You now have a place to start digging for church records that could tell you more about your female ancestor. If the church is no longer operating, make some calls and see if you can find out where their records were sent when they closed their doors. What did she do at a church that made her a prominent worker? She's listed here, a prominent worker in the Mifflin Street Methodist Episcopal Church. Did she teach classes, work as a secretary, organize fundraisers, et cetera, et cetera? Some churches would keep not only dates of death for members, but a record of when they were born, baptized, and married, as well as their cause of death and funeral information. So if you get lucky, unfortunately, I did not with the Mifflin Street Church, but if you get lucky, you can find out a lot more just from church records. Um, this is another example of a great place to look for things, uh, would be the death the death certificates, oh, what was that? The death certificates of children or siblings. So just because a lot of times what you'll see on a death certificate will be over here where it says name of father, you may see unknown, or it may be inaccurate information because they're relying on the information of whoever the informant is. So if the informant is, for instance, this person's child and her parents have long since been gone and he can't remember their names, it's just gonna say unknown under there. However, if her sister dies at the same time, 
like this one over here, and that child does remember the name of the parents, now you've got somewhere to search. So you always wanna make sure that you search outside. We're gonna talk a little bit about searching the FAN principle, the family, associates, and neighbors. Search outside your target. Just because you can't find that information for Matilda specifically, doesn't mean that Mary's death certificate would not have that information you're looking for. So here you can see Albert Cook listed on both of these death certificates and Basintha, which I had never heard of as a name, that was a new one on me, Lane is the maiden name of the mother on both of these certificates. Medical records are another one you can check. Now medical records, you're very rarely gonna get lucky on medical records for obvious reasons. Um, they can include hospital or doctor's records or even midwives journals. Medical records can be hard to find and they are not common. Doctors may have published or donated their records. Our collection, for example, has a set of journals and medical records for Dr. George Colmer of Livingston Parish. Um, they were typed up and then bound into a book and donated to the library. So we do have medical records and that can tell you a lot more information about a family. You can identify a physician in your ancestors community by searching census records and then determine if that physician may have left records. You can find hospital and asylum records in archival collections too. However, most hospital records, especially asylums or mental health hospitals have been lost to time or were intentionally destroyed for obvious reasons. Uh, clues that your ancestor was institutionalized can be found by looking at census schedules. So if your ancestor was in an institution or a hospital of some kind, they will show up in that place on a census record if they happen to be in there during a census year. Um, many midwives journals have been published and microfilmed. Immigrant women in large communities usually use midwives to, to deliver their children. These journals contain information on births that they were that they had attended. The best place to check for any of those is in WorldCat. So we're going to talk a little bit about WorldCat. Um, that is, I, I'll show you at the end. That is the worldwide uh, library database. If you search for a specific title or a specific call number, it will tell you where in relation to you that book can be found. Um, just because you can find it in WorldCat does not necessarily mean that we will be able to get it. However, a lot of, especially with genealogy books or um, special books, specialized books, they're not, they don't get sent out for interlibrary loan. We don't loan out our genealogy books because they're usually limited run. Uh, there were only so many of them published. And if we don't get them back, we can't replace them. So a lot of places won't, but if you happen to be taking a trip for instance, if your family is from Boston and you happen to be taking a trip to do some genealogical research while you're in Boston, it's a good idea to check WorldCat before you go up there and see if any of the local libraries in that area would have books that might pertain to your family history. Um, again, sometimes you get lucky and people will bar loan them out, but not, not commonly. Veterans and widows pensions can be super helpful for those of us who um, had family who went through the Civil War in an area where records were pretty well decimated. Um, specifically the Civil War, though the Revolutionary War as well, but the Civil War lost a lot of, of documentation, uh, especially throughout the South, because of the war. So the veteran censuses can give you a lot of the information and widows pension application, that kind of thing, can give you a lot of the information that was destroyed in the war. Uh, pension applications for the Civil War, War of 1812, and Revolutionary War are some of the best resources for finding data on a family. A widow's pension can reveal her maiden name, parents and siblings, place of birth, and previous husbands. Search for pensions under, under the veteran's name, but make sure you search under the widow's name as well. Were when both, hmm? Were pensions for both sides? Pensions, yes. Yes. Pensions were for both sides some places. <laughs> I, I feel like I feel like I can't remember off the top of my head which, but I do know that I've seen Civil War widows pension applications for Confederate soldiers, but I can't tell you for sure which areas would have had them regularly or not. Um, and that went through the federal. Government. Yeah, yeah. And then one of the things that you're going to run into a lot, as I keep saying, I feel like I keep saying this over and over, but it's the truth. It depends on your area. 
some some places kept those records really really well and some places didn't most of them are going to be held at the state level so if the state held on to them great if not um but some of them will be held at the national level so when you browse through pension applications you might find copies of marriage certificates family bibles or ledgers and testimony from families and friends federal pension acts changed over time too, loosening requirements to obtain a pension for example, after 1853, the widow did not need to be married to the veteran at the time of his service. So as, as time went on, that's what I was saying. You know, some places have them, some places don't, some places did not accept them for Confederate soldiers, some places did. It changed over time and there's no set set of rules for this is how we did it from 1861 on. Like it would be 1861 to 1865 here, did it this way but here they did it this way. So it kind of, it always behooves you to do research on that kind of thing on the entire area, the state, the county, whatever, and see what you can find for that specific area and then go from there. So here's a couple of examples of pension applications. Um, the, both of these are from the War of 1812. On the left is for a man named Jesse McCoy, gives you his birth date and his wife's birth date. Now you do see here that um, Eliza is just listed as Eliza McCoy. So it does not give her maiden name here, but it does give their marriage date. So you might be able to narrow down from this application where and when they got married. Well, you can where and when they got married. So you should be able to find a copy of the marriage license if it still exists. It also lists the name of each of their children and when they were born. War of 1812 pension for John R. Breland over here gives evidence for his second wife. So you can see here, Mary Lewis, certified copy of marriage uh, record of the count of Pike County in Mississippi, identifying witnesses, so on and so forth. So it gives you information about a second wife or a first wife that you may not have known about. Wills, probates, and deeds. Okay, so these are tricky as well. Deeds, wills, and probates can be some of the more difficult researches, records to search. These require more time and effort because the evidence or clues that you're looking for may not be direct. In addition, you will probably search for the husband's name in these records. If you're searching for wills and probates, for example, you may find the names of a woman's father or brothers. In some cases though, you may find, you may find a few names, but you won't always see a relationship stated. So make sure that you copy the names of any administrators, executors, bondsmen, or witnesses found in the records. Keep an eye out for unfamiliar names because these could be the wife's father or brothers, brothers-in-law, et cetera. Search for the wills and probates in order to find the name of the female ancestor. Again, she will be listed alongside her husband unless she's a widow, if at all. So a lot of times, again, you'll find her only listed as Mrs. William McCoy. Um, dower releases are usually a paragraph found in a deed in which the wife weighs her, waives her legal right to the portion of her husband's property. A widow usually received automatically a third to half of her husband's property. She has to release her dower rights so that the property can be sold. Deeds won't usually give you a maiden name, but they do help you locate the woman at a specific time and place and help determine family relationships. So if the property is divided between the wife and the sons, and they all decide together that they want to sell the property off to use the money as, you know, for her to live on or whatever, she has to sign that and she has to sign it in witness of other people that she's not been coerced into signing this or she's not doing it under pressure or whatever. And she has to release her rights to those lands so they can be sold. So this is a really great example of finding more information than you initially expected to in a will. So wills, a lot of times they will, they will directly name daughters and they will directly name wives. Other people in those relationships, you will usually see her named other ways. So we're gonna talk about that in a minute too. A last will and testament, this is a last will and testament for a man named Henry Havens, who died in December of 1853. He was married to his first wife, Sarah, for over 40 years before her death in the summer of 1852. We wrongly assumed that since he died within roughly a year and a half of her, 
and is buried next to Sarah that he never remarried. However, when we finally found his actual will, we see that he did in fact remarry to Sarah's younger sister, Harriet. So we see here, third, I give unto my wife, my beloved wife, Harriet Havens, in lieu of her dower, the use and occupation of the farm on which we now reside. So we see here that not only did he actually get remarried, but down here, one of the stipulations is provided she does keep and maintain our infant child, Mary J. Havens. So not only did we find out that he had a second wife, he had another child as well. But the important thing about that was we were able to find the marriage record for Harriet and Henry, and it gives Harriet's maiden name. So we were able to find Sarah's maiden name through his second marriage because he married her sister and were able to find the father's name. When we found the will of Harriet and Sarah's father, it listed Henry Havens as one of the executors of his will. And that's how we were sure that we had the right Sarah. Looking around your person can give you information that you would not have found had you just stuck to looking for your person. This is the research cycle. So we were talking in the beginning about some ways to kind of get around these brick walls that you will regularly run into when you're researching women. The research cycle is a continuous process. Every time you uncover something new, you have to write it down, find its place in your timeline and start over again. Let the research guide cycle help guide you. As you research and use these different records, you will organize the facts that you discover. You can do this with paper charts and forms or genealogy software. If you don't find a female ancestor surname or her parents, you will probably need to expand your search. Being organized will help you to do that. So if you keep track of where you have already looked or you keep track of where you need to look next, you will not step back on yourself <laughs> as I have done many times because I didn't do that. You will not step back over yourself and end up searching something you've already searched twice. You set a goal, find a female ancestor's maiden name. Let's say that's our goal here, okay? You're gonna choose a source, start examining marriage certificates, indexes, children's births, baptisms, or death records, whatever you think you have the best chance of finding that information. Locate said source, start digging in the first place that seems logical to you. If she arrived in the United States in 1880 as a married woman, you probably obviously will want to start looking for records back in her home country. Um, most ship manifests after the 1840s required passengers to list, list their nationality. They weren't always accurate, but it was a good start. Um, and a lot of times it would just give, of course, the whole country. Sometimes you'd get lucky and it would say Liverpool, England, but a lot of times it would just say England. So now you got a whole country, but at least it narrows it down to something. Transfer information. We know that she was married before 1880 as she traveled with her husband. Her name matched his, as we discussed with the French and Italian records and her four-year-old daughter. So we're, you know, in this scenario, we're talking about a woman who arrived in 1880, already married with a four-year-old daughter and all their names matched up. This puts a good starting date for your marriage record search somewhere around 1875. Um, presuming that they were married when they had their daughter, as most people would have been at the time. Uh, that gives you, if they only have one child and her birthday, you know, she's about four years old, start back about a year before the first child was born. Cite your sources. Once you can find something that you deem definitive, you write down everything about it. Make sure you take down the name of the book, the page, the volume number, where you found it, who published it, make your copies, all that stuff. My philosophy is always, it's better to have it and not need it than to need it and not have it. If you realize later that you had the right person and you threw that resource out, now you have to go back and find your resource again. <laughs> copy and file, copy everything, whether it's hard copies or digital, save it all. It's easier to get rid of it later than it is to track it down again. And then evaluate. Can you find anything under this newfound name for childhood or young adulthood? So once you find, say, you know, you're able to trace her back to England and you're able to find that marriage record. Now you can start tracing back further. A census record, a church record, baptism record, any kind of paper trail. If not, start the cycle over. Could she have been married once before? So again, if you can't find a definitive thing for what you're looking for right now, expand your circle, work outward.
And that's what we're gonna talk about with our next little thing here. This is our fan principle. So it's family, associates, and neighbors. Your center target or your center circle is your target. This is the person that you're looking for. Um, expanding out from there, you're gonna look at the husband and the children of your target person and then her family members. So parents, siblings, um, stepchildren, any other people that you feel like might be able to shed some light on your person. Uh, then you're gonna expand out a little bit further to her friends and associates and then to her neighbors. So looking around your person, both um, relationship wise and physically can often help to unlock some of those doors for you. So what we wanna do when you're applying that fan principle is analyze, analyze, identify, and then fan out. So start by asking yourself, who are the members of this fan club you're looking at here? Um, make a list of their associates. What did they do together? When, where, why, and how frequently did they associate? Then identify resources and other venues to search for those people as well. Again, you're gonna to wanna to start with the person closest to her and work your way out because you never know in this circle exactly where you might find somebody who has more information on your person. So if you strike out on the individual herself and you strike out on her husband, you might get lucky with her children. But if you strike out with her children, you might get lucky with a brother. And if you strike out with her brother, you might get lucky just by looking around her physically, geographically, and find some information in that town. So contact people who may have information to share with you. If you are doing some research on ancestry or you are doing some research on family search, or you are reading some articles on you know, a Facebook group who are people that seem to know a lot about either the area or the family that you are researching, it never hurts to reach out to them and see if they have any more information to offer you. Brainstorming with other genealogists can open doors you didn't even know you could find. Being creative, again, thinking outside that box. Um, just because you can't find anything for your particular target ancestor doesn't mean maybe if you look for her sister or you look for her brother, you might not be able to find that information that you were looking for. And then just keep going. A lot of it is just perseverance. These are some of the records that reveal who lived in proximity to each other. Use them to help build you a map of the people around her, the neighborhood that she lived in. So census records, cemetery records, church registrars, records or minutes, tax rolls, petitions, court cases, land maps. A lot of times, like we have one in um, the genealogy room that is a map of Baton, East Baton Rouge Parish in 1895. And it lists who held the various tracts of land around East Baton Rouge Parish and how large they were. So if you are researching one of those particular farms and you wanna look around those people, that's a great resource to find out who lived right next door to your ancestor. And sometimes searching for them will give you some information about the person that you're looking for. Maybe they bought land off of each other. Maybe they sold to each other. Maybe they were in business together, so on and so forth. And the more that you find out about the people around your target ancestor, the more likely you are to start filling in the blanks for the person that you're looking for. This is some of the further reading. Um, these are really good books. This one I use quite often. I actually went and bought my own copy of this so I could make notes in it. Um, this one is a really great resource if you're trying to learn about laws that sp specifically pertained to women and their rights in the early 20, or in the early 18th century, rather, seven, 18th and 19th century America. And then this one is also good. Um, I haven't read it all the way through, to be honest with you, but it's been really good what I have seen of it. So it never hurts to pick up other resources as well. Um, this one is really interesting if you're trying to learn why women may have done what they did in relationship to the men in their lives. So like inheriting business, selling off business, dowers, that kind of thing. It, this explains a lot of the property rights that went with women in those eras. This is how to collect, contact us, rather collect us. <laughs> Special Collections Genealogy Department, we're here in the main library. Um, we're actually down at the other end of the building uh, under the Special Collections sign. You can call us anytime, this is our direct number. And this email is a 
uh, department-wide email. So if you send something to that, it comes to all of us. So you are more than welcome if you are stuck on something or if you have any questions that you feel like didn't really get answered in this, feel free to come down and have a sit down with us and we will walk you through where you're stuck and see if we can give you some resources for your particular problem. Because kind of, as I said, all the way through this, everything varies a little bit. There's no way for me to hit on every single problem for, you know, you may have family from France and you may have family from England and you may have family from, you know, wherever. And so it helps us to know if you're stuck somewhere exactly where you're stuck, we can help you that way. All right, and I'm gonna open the floor for questions if anybody has anything. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so the midwife journal. Mm -hmm. If I was looking for a midwife in family care, how would they list it in a journal or decide? In the, the, the midwife journals usually were kept by the midwives themselves. So they kept their own records um, or they would be kept by a doctor or somebody that they worked with. Um, so okay. My first suggestion for that would be to see who the midwives in East Baton Rouge Parish were right around that time by checking the census. The census will usually list if she was a midwife under her occupation. So start going through the census for East Baton Rouge Parish for say 1880 or whatever it is that you're looking for and see who is listed as a midwife. And then you can uh, see if there are any journals or medical records around that woman by searching for her in that world cat that we talked about. I will show you that very quickly. All right, hold on my people at home. I'm gonna change your screen. Oops, I gotta open my screen. There we go. Now we're changing our screen. Well, come on. There it is. I don't know why it's being so slow today. Okay, so you would come to WorldCat, helps if you spell, .org. Yeah, 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 cookies. And then it's gonna give you ways to search. So you can search for literally anything in WorldCat. DVDs, books, CDs, articles, newspapers, um, anything. But what you'd wanna type in here, so here you go, there's, New Zealand College of Midwives, letters to the midwife, so on and so forth. Uh, over in here, you can narrow your filter down by language, content, biography, nonfiction, audience, topic, medicine, history, and auxiliary. There you go. So you can see here we have all different kinds. Now I'm I'm not pulling. Oh, nope. I'm not pulling anything up right now. But with just a quick search, but you'd have to play with your parameters. Then once you find whatever you're looking for. So this is actually a VHS video, but for an example, and then you can come down here and it'll tell you exactly where it's held. So Las Vegas library has a copy, New York public library system has a copy. It'll tell you exactly where it is, add to favorites, all that stuff. And it'll tell you down here. Oh, no, it's been a minute since I've used the is it this one? Do I click on it? I think so. Yeah, but there's a there's a way you can request it, but I I can't remember. Like I said, it's been a minute since I've used WorldCat, and it's not wanting to load. But there is a way that you can request. There you go. Nope. That just takes you to their site. Interesting. Okay, there is a way that you can do it. I just can't remember off the top of my head how you do it. Oh, there you go. Get a copy, find a copy. And then, down. oh, it takes you back down here. Okay. It's been a minute since I've done this, but there is a way that you can request it via this site. Whether or not it would actually be able to be fulfilled depends on the library itself. So I will show you that. I also want to show you 
Okay, so to find all those resources that we were talking about, uh, Ancestry is available through our library if you have a library card through the end of the year. So um, Ancestry Library Edition, we actually teach a class on that. It's a really good class. And it works a lot like Ancestry. You cannot build a tree. You can't use any of the social aspects of it, but you can um, search for records, download, email them to yourself, that kind of thing. So you just come here to our library website, come over here to the digital library, A to Z list or by subject and genealogy, whichever you're more comfortable with, and ancestry.com, which also does not want to load today. Um, you can do that, I think, if you have a paid subscription. I can't do it via the, the library. Um, but I have seen, yeah, it's not wanting to cooperate with me today. It never fails. I have seen little pencils next to records where users have submitted corrected information, but you cannot do that with the library edition. You can only do that with the paid edition. Um, but that's how you get there, even though apparently EBRPL does not want to cooperate with me this afternoon, wants to make me look like I don't know what I'm doing. Digital library by subject, genealogy. These are all of our genealogy resources. We have everything from Heritage Quest and Family Search and Find My Past. We have the Black Studies Center. We have Gale courses, which are great because they have genealogy courses on there as well. So all of these are great resources. Almost all of them can be used from home as well, as long as you have your library card with you. Um, EBRPL.com, I'm gonna take you back here real quickly. And the last thing I wanna show everybody before I let you go, look at that right on time, 3.30. Down here at the very bottom of the page, this is our genealogy info guide. The main page has some links, lets you know what we're up to lately, where to find us. These hours are not correct right now because of COVID. But all of that good stuff right here is the tab that I really want to make sure y'all get to see before I let you go. This is our classes offered tab. So this is where you can sign up for classes. And they'll go up here pretty much before they'll go up anywhere else. Uh, I take care of this page. So does Mr. John. So here you can see this is October's already. So yeah, you can sign up for October classes before they even hit the source. So this is a great place. We usually open them up about a month before they go live. Uh, the original covered the entire census range from 1790 to 1940, and it was too much for one class. <laughs> so we split it into two classes. Now we do 1790 to 1840, and then 1850 to 1940. And we do that because in 1850 is when they started keeping track of every free person in America by name. So it's two different ways to do research depending on that split right there. Um, after that period, it becomes much easier to be sure that you have the right family because you'll have them listed by name. Before that split, you have to know a little bit about the family already to be sure that you have the right person. So we specifically had a request for that class um, last month because we taught the new one, which was census non-population schedules. And one of the things that we really wanted to get into with that class and didn't have time to do were um, the main census, touching on the main censuses and the slave schedules. So this class touches on both of those much more readily. Thank you, thank you. I really enjoyed that class. So yes, this is what I wanted to make sure. And then right here next to it is our classes on demand tab, um, which hasn't been updated in a minute. And I'm, I apologize for that. That's also me putting these things in here is such a pain, but here is also all of the forms and charts that we usually give out in class. So you can download these anytime and print them out at home. So if you need another pedigree chart to fill in as you're doing your research, there it is. Um, and then also here are the notes for every class that we teach. Introduction to genealogy software, DNA testing, everything is here. So you can just click right here, right here. Hello, there we go. And see our notes as well as our slides for every class that we teach. All right, I think, I yes, ma'am. You mentioned veterans and, and folks with the veterans. Where do you do that? Uh, the veteran schedules are going to be on Ancestry. Um, okay. And then once you find your person on the veteran schedules, 
then you can usually keep searching. Some of them are available. Again, I hate saying this. It depends on the state. Some of them are available on Ancestry. Some of them you have to go through Fold 3, which is a, kind of an Ancestry offshoot that does specifically military records. And some of them are actually held at the state level and they've not been released to like Ancestry and you might have to actually contact that state. So, so where would the state so okay. would be? So the archive I'm not 100% sure off the top of my head where you'd get a copy of it, but I will find that out for you. Just because I want to say yes, but don't quote me on that. Well, we, we yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, so I can search there. I, I've also family search. I will tell you. It's Probably a little bit better than the end of it. Yes. Family search is is really wonderful. Um, it's not as user friendly as Ancestry is, but Family Search actually does have more records than Ancestry does. Yeah. Family Search is free. Now they do have some record collections that are held to um libraries. So you have to be an affiliate library, of which we are one. Um, to access a few collections and then some of the most specialized collections you have to actually go to a family search history center, um, which are run by the LDS church the nearest one to us here is on Highland Road. Um, and they have access to a few things that even we don't have access to so it just kind of depends, but the vast majority of everything is available to anyone. Fold three is through the, your library. Yes, yes fold three if it will cooperate here, I will show you. But since it is an, an Ancestry offshoot, I can't promise it will because apparently Ancestry is being a little finicky today too. Digital you life? Ancestry to get uh, you do not if you go through us. Okay. Um, if you, I think that the world traveler package for Ancestry uh, will give you access to that, but you have to be like the higher tier yeah, of Ancestry. Right, right. And no, apparently it doesn't want to cooperate with me right now either. It's just spinning. You it but you can. Yep, here it is right here. So you go to the digital library and then go by subject, hit genealogy, and it's right here. Fold three history and genealogy archives. I will tell, go ahead. You have to be in the library to access it? Yes, that? you do have to be in the library to access it. Um, obviously via our thing. Um, and I think that's actually the only one that one and Heritage Quest, I think, are the only two that you now have to actually physically be in the library to use. Mm -hmm. um, Ancestry has extended their home use of Ancestry Library Edition until the end of the year, which we really appreciate. That's been a wonderful resource. Was that the COVID? Yes, mm -hmm. yes. And they have been really understanding about the COVID situation. All right. It depends. Yeah. Okay. So she's asking, I'm letting everybody on Zoom now. She's asking specifically about cemetery records. And again, I hate to say this depends from cemetery to cemetery. Um, certain cemeteries, like I know, for instance, the Allegheny Cemetery in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania keeps a, an actual ledger that will tell you where the funeral home was, what the person died of, exactly their age, the day they were born, the day they died. And other cemeteries keep nothing. Like the only thing they have is the location of the grave. It just honestly depends on the cemetery. Um, but we have in our um, library collection back here, we have a ton of really great books that are comp compilations from cemeteries that go back way back. So some of the headstones and stuff that no longer exist will be listed in those books because they were they were compiled in the 40s, 50s, 60s, 80 years ago when those headstones still existed. So if you can't find it on like find a grave or if you can't find it on, you know, billion graves or whatever, check stuff like that because it may just be that the headstone no longer exists, but the plot is still there. You're very welcome. Any other questions? I'm gonna go ahead and, oh, oh thank you. Y'all are wonderful. All right, 
then I'm going to go ahead and close out. Um, if anybody doesn't have any questions, I'm going to go ahead and close out. And then um, I have to get back over so I can let my coworker go home. <laughs> But thank you all so much. If you have any other questions, um, like I said, you are more than welcome to contact us. You can always contact us. We are happy to hear from you. So, oh yes, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. All right, y'all have a wonderful day.